I'd like to preface the uh, discussion by saying, I think what's exciting is that we have different methods here and we could triangulate the different methods to, you know, um, somehow come up with uh, uh, consistencies uh, and, and perhaps uh, better approaches using different types of methods. So I, I wanted to start off um, with asking you, Ray, um, can you describe how the other methods might be applied in the type of approach that you described today? And as I understand it, the approach today was primarily empirical. It relied on the data. Could you then um, incorporate, um, for example, an expert elicitation or a discrete choice analysis or experimental market analysis um, on top of that and see how that might affect the results? Yeah, absolutely. And the answer is a thousand percent yes, because, for example, doing elicitation. So if you're building a model with with a Bayesian network, you can, you know, conceptually specify a model or you can have a group of experts specify the structure of a model. But then you're going to need, you know, parameter estimation. Right. And how are you going to do that? Well, you use the expert elicitation methods that uh, Island you know, mentioned uh, as, as kind of one approach when, when there's no, you know, good data to, to draw from. And then likewise, I think what both, you know, Jody presented and Warren presented as methods for, you know, generating, um, um, you, know, val you know, parameter values for some of these associations, I think could be very complementary to, to a, you know, a Bayesian network approach. So I, I see the, you know, everything kind of swimming together Together in a in a really nice way, um, so and and we, you know we we should all be doing that. We should all be kind of talking and sharing information and and sort of saying, well, geez, how could I you know use what you've developed, the information that you have? Can we you know in this case you know put it into a Bayesian network? There are other kinds of modeling approaches. The thing I, I like about the Bayesian networks is they're very user friendly in terms of being able to build models and, and uh, you know, populate the models with data and that sort of thing. So that's just my, my bias, but, but yeah, I think it's pretty exciting. But, and, and, and that leads to kind of looking at it from the other perspective too. And I, I'll ask you about this uh, Ray first, but I'd like to hear from the others too. And that is um, in the other methods that were discussed today, you know, there's a structure that's used. In other words, you decide to look at various types of substitution between products or switching. Can your process be used, the one that you, such as you described today, based on data, particularly based on longitudinal path data, can that be used to help structure the other types of expert elicitation, discrete choice analysis, experimental marketplace. And, and uh, again, you know, I'd like to hear from you first, but then hear what others um, have to say about you know, bringing uh, these, these methods together. Yeah, well, it's, again, you can specify time series. So you can have something called dynamic Bayesian networks, but, but you can sort of then, you know, draw in influence arrows and say, well, you know, what if a tax increase happens here? What if this, you know, product is unavailable or, you know, these products are unavailable as Warren was saying, what about, you know, illegal products, black market, all of that can definitely be, um, you know, modeled in a, in a network structure. But again, you'd need to have some, um, you know, ideas of what, what effects would be. So, you know, you'd have to get that information through the, you know, experimental marketplace or, you know, through the dis discrete choice experiments or through elicitation. But I, I, I see that as, you know, again, very, very compatible. <clears throat> yes, I, th I think it's a follow up and maybe to bring it up like that, how much, for instance, and I guess that's what you're getting at, David, that how much do available empirical data inform how you end up designing, for instance, an expert elicitation, maybe it's, it's uh, 
it's it's relatively easy to, to, to think about it conceptually, right? You, whatever the data is, is something you share with the experts um, and maybe your questions are based on, on the current prevalence rates, what have you. Um, I presume it's the same for discrete, discrete choice experiments as well as, as experimental market just to help design the, the, the specific experiments that you're going to do. And in particular, I mean, the transitions themselves, what you see in the real world can help inform the, the types of transitions that might be um, explicitly considered in an expert elicitation or um, street choice or experimental marketplace. So um, others, uh, do, do you see a value of a, you know, uh, how you might use empirical data and, and then also how, how you might use um, one of the other approaches that's been described to you know, bring together these different approaches. Could I, uh, this is Jody, can you hear me? Could I add, say something about that and also answer a little bit of the question that I was asked sure. before? For, uh, because I think it's a good idea to bring them all together because when, I, when the question was, oh, is discrete choice experiment, you know, better or worse data. I look across everything and everything has a big weakness, like experiment, experimental data or um, the discrete choice experiment is called a stated preference. And you can compare, that's what you what you state versus real world data, but real world data have big problems too, like the scanner data, you might think that's fabulous, because, but scanner data, when they scan a cigarette pack, you don't know who smokes it, whether they store it or whether they, went to another store where there wasn't being scanned. So I'm saying to look across is really good. And one of the ways which was asked about the discrete choice experiment is we do compare it to see if it's internally consistent. Like, do we find price uh, has a negative of, you know, higher prices are worse. And once we found an internal inconsistency, which made us delve into why, and it, it there were other facts, like for one subgroup, I can't even remember what it was, they were behaving oddly because they really liked health more than anything. They didn't care what they priced. They want to like the, they want to smoke or vape, but it's the healthiest one. So I think that bringing it, looking across is really important because I don't think we have the global benchmark. We can compare everything to it and say, well, you're biased in this way or that way. And I think you need a really big sample in order to, my view, I, I believe in big ends and the nationally representative sample of smokers. So getting people coming together with even smaller samples might add up to more general truth. So I think that would be very good. And I'll just say one other quick thing. For, I didn't go through the advantage of discrete choice experiments or how, like any other, any other there are really important methods that you could make it a, a better, uh, like you, outcomes, like you can give people uh, sample questions. Um, so there are lots of ways to make, it, not a discrete choice experiment done well is a lot better than one that's just done without being uh, you know, thorough in how you increase the quality of data and the sample representation, things like that. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, go I, ahead. Okay. I've got Go ahead, Ray, and then Eileen. Yeah, yeah I got a question for both uh, Jody and, and Warren. So I guess how scalable are your methods, right? I mean, you, you can do these, you know, online, right? That's what um, I did, only online. Yeah, but, you know, and, and but given enough resources, you could probably then, you know, capture quasi-representative samples and so forth. So, so I guess my question is, um, you know, why aren't, why isn't the FDA, why, why don't they, they have set up funded labs devoted to, to answering the policy regulatory questions that they are thinking about? So why, why don't they set up a Sindelar DCE lab and a Bickel experimental marketplace lab? Because it seems to me that Given the scalability and the ability, as as Warren mentioned, you know, the you're limited only by your own imagination, that that you could be, you know, deploying studies after study after study and getting just a bunch of, you know, incredible data for us all. 
So I guess my, 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 maybe it's a dumb question, but it's like, why, why isn't this happening? So, so up to the FDA, I'm available. <laughs> um, uh, but I think, um, I, so I think, um, I think you're right. Can, these methods are deployable. Uh, one of the things I think would be interesting is are looking at consistency across the methods. What, what are the variations? Um, the experimental tobacco marketplace, one of the values that it uniquely has is, as you saw, is we're always looking at a function. We're not looking at a data point, right? We're looking at a systematic manipulation of a variable, either dose or price over and over again. And the beauty of that is, you know, part of the uh, replication crisis that confronts um, many fields, including some that overlap ours, is they're often looking at one point in a curve. And we all know curves can be curvy linear and, and where you decide to compare can produce different outcomes. When you have a whole function, you have a, a, a deeper um, set of variables by which to explain the phenomena and, um, and are less likely to run into the issue of I just picked the wrong two points. So can I, I think that's a wonderful idea. And with the discrete choice experiments, we have samples of about 2000 and we have quotas so that they are nationally represented of a smoker, of a vapor. And I, as I said, I certainly believe in large samples that should be representative of the population. So, and it takes about, sometimes it's hard to fill specific quotas, but it can be two, two months to get 2,000 people. And you can put in, again, anything you want, like this time, well, in, in, this is different. In the real world survey we're doing right now, we ask about the valley and COVID. Uh, so you can be timely and ask what would affect someone's decision right now. And, uh, and we also have functions because we manipulate you know, price from low to high, nicotine from low to high. But really, you can do anything you want. The question is to do the most important or what, what's the missing piece right there. And DCEs are very good when you don't have a real world option, but they are also, and so real world is sometimes better, but the DCEs can be useful because you can manipulate so many things at the same time. And, you know, suppose it were this, suppose this happened, um, train them on how to do these. So it seems like a wonderful idea. Do you, so think, maybe, that, do you think that you, you would be able to find you know perhaps regional differences say within the US in terms of some some of the results that you've shown us both both Warren and Jody yes we we in different situations we we do have the region we we, set, we sample by regions but we know the state so we could definitely show that and i think it's important because the supply is different and uh, we're talking about this in the real world data but we also know the policies are different Different states have different underlying uh, desire, you know, to pass laws to control tobacco, and, or the e-cigarette markets enter in the West Coast and slowly get to the Midwest. Or so, yes, all those things by age, by gender, differences by age, gender, race, region. Um, I guess you need the end, right? That's that's yeah. as, as long as you have the end. Yes. Uh, so maybe just just let's oh, let's maybe um, Eileen, if you don't mind. Commenting, yeah. I, I'm curious to hear Lynn's thoughts, uh, and 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 again, maybe maybe also making the contrast of information that might come from from different perspectives, right? I think uh, the three of you had the, the perspective of getting information from users uh, or potential users, or either uh, perspective or or their prediction of what they're going to do, and, and I guess with the path analysis retrospective. But yeah, what about Eileen? Yeah, any thoughts or comments about this? Sure, um, before I comment on that, I just want to make a quick comment on um, these types of primary data collections to natural uh, discrete choice experiments from smokers or non-smokers. Um, I'm not... Um, I don't work for the FDA, but I've obviously have done a number of projects for the FDA. Um, there is something called the, one of the hurdles for implementing that center that you might be envisioning is um, the Paperwork Reduction Act, um, which limits um, primary data collection efforts. Anytime you reach out to more than nine entities or individuals, you do need an agency needs a clearance from the Office of Management and Budget, which could take 
um, up to two years or more for each collection method. Um, so that's a, that's a um, hurdle. Um, and, and that would be if you are within the FDA or, or within the, the federal government, right? That is if you're in, a, in the federal government or if the federal government is contracting out this, um, this work. The contracts, okay. It's we have that to the PRA. It's a real problem. It is a real problem, yes. <laughs> the one that we've encountered too many times. But if it's um, a grant, not operating, right? Um, I think they were, OMB was, um, maybe grants weren't there, uh, weren't on their radar and they were more flexible before, but um, I believe grants, uh, these types of primary data collections done under federal agency grants would also be subject to the PRA. Maybe NIH, I, I've had it, well, anyhow, it's, it'd be good to know the exact facts. So, I mean, re related to this, and I, I like that, that the way you pose it, Ray, of thinking about having centers that can produce some of this information, right? And, and as, I mean, if we think about uh, maybe the model that we can see from what was, uh, or how it was communicated that there was uh, the intention to regulate nicotine and how uh, FDA did modeling, which was informed by an expert elicitation. So certainly the pieces are there in terms of saying, this is one way in which uh, some of these <clears throat> uh, plans could move forward with the right information. So I think, uh, it's it's worth to think about. Well, if we were going to set up those 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 uh, centers, and and that we can get different information from different centers, or maybe a single center that collects all this information. I mean, a question that comes to mind, and of course, it's related or or not easy to 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 probably determine in general because it's going to be a function of how much, what do you want to do and how many people and all of that. But I was curious, and, and maybe this is a naive question, but I, just in terms of thinking about how, how quickly we can do some of those analysis, like if, if FDA or, or a regulator or an agency or, or a government needs a, an analysis of what will be the impact of this policy and there is not much information, how long would it take, for instance, to plan conduct, execute, and get results, uh, an experimental market analysis, or a discrete choice experiment, or an expert elicitation? Is this something that can be done uh, within a year, within six months, within two months? What is, what is the, 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 the level of, <clears throat> of speed that could be achieved so that that can be thought in this, in this form, right? Like, that, yeah. That, like, that's a great question, Raphael. Um, I saw the way to think about it is what kind of question you answer. Are you trying to understand um, a range of conditions? And then once you understand them, go large. I think that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, and that's the value of the type of work that I'm doing, right? I'm getting a range of conditions and, and that sets the occasion to say, well, we have an idea of what the parameter space is and now we can pick the optimal ones. Um, and the fact that we can do it within subject permits us to eliminate some sources of variability that otherwise might be noise and allow a stronger uh, a, a understanding of some of the effects. But uh, those studies can, you know, at, at different scales can be done rather rapidly online, assuming that there are people available to do them and you get access to them, right? As you get into more refined samples, right? So. I want a dual user that uses e-cigarettes X amount and still smokes cigarettes of X amount. Well, it, you know, it takes longer to identify them and accumulate them. Um, but I think generally it's, it's pretty quick. And some of these studies, uh, we can get the answer to, you know, in a matter of months, not, not a year. It's, it's a matter of resources, right? I mean, if you have enough um, you know, money to, to set up the, the studies, then you should, you should be able to do them quickly. Um, would, would that be the same for ECEs and expert presentations? Like, are we talking about in terms of these different approaches being comparable in, in their time scale, uh, given the right resources that, that you should be able to do them all in a relatively quick time frame? Is, would that, that correct? Or? 
Yes, that's that's applicable to expert also patients too. I mean, as long as you have the resources um, and know the exact questions you want to ask, then doing the expert elicitation is um, fairly quick. The, so with a discrete choice experiment, again, if you have the resources, you can do it. And we have now a battery of a, a whole bunch of different surveys. So that developing a new survey takes less and less time. And it might take two months to get 2,000 people with a quota as national representative, but depends whether you want like something a little bit unusual, like not unusual, <laughs> harder to find like black um, menthol smokers with low education. They're just people that are hard to find online. So one of the things about an online survey is that highly educated women, white women are probably most likely to be online. And that's why you have to set up quotas and some quotas are hard uh, to fill. And I, just as long as we have, you know, these uh, quasi-experimental studies also can be done. Uh, it's a longer discussion how long they take and all that, but that's another method that now that we have, you know, that now that we have real world policies to study, we might as well study them. So uh, David Abrams has his hand, uh, raised his hand. So why don't we give him the, uh, the next question? Go ahead. Oh. Thanks. Um, in the absence of other questions. Um, so uh, I really love this conversation and the key questions stimulated both by David Ray and several of the comments from Aylan, Jody and Warren. And I do wish Andy was here because of PATH. Um, so just throw out a couple of thoughts about how to increase the triangulation, the energy and the resources because I think, um, you know, one comment, Ray has only just scratched the surface with what he did with Bayesia Lab and three waves of data. PATH actually has five waves of data. And as you know, you know, repeated measures on five data points on trajectories, transitions, and complex interrelationships between different products is hugely informative even compared to three data points. So that's point number one. And clearly Ray could do what he's doing and add wave four and wave five and have even more interesting and perhaps stronger relationships as you follow the same people over three or four or five years out from the baseline. Second point, is we talked about this at the inception of PATH and it's never really been done, but this is a perfect opportunity, especially with the Castor Center, which we conceptualized exactly the way this discussion is going. And that point is that um, you could, as Warren and others suggested, David Levy here, you could um, pick a small purpose of subsample of existing path participants who've already got three or four waves of data to inform you of who you actually want to test in the real world with whatever a key subset of uh, a discrete choice experiment might be or something Warren's doing in his lab or even something stimulated to inform an expert solicitation. So that kind of triangulation is usually met with resistance. The resistance is, oh, we can't touch the sample of 40,000 households at all because there's reactivity and contamination and blah, blah, blah. Yet we have suggested that actually within a large sample like this, if you pick a purpose of subsample of specific interest, and you still have a fairly large sample within that subsample, you could pick some of them at random and not necessarily contaminate in any big way the overall sample. And of course, you can use um, you know, electronic web-based and other ways of sampling people in between the now two-year gap between each path survey that, that is now being um, conducted. And, and finally, you know, I think if we were concerned about reactivity, 
of repeated measures or asking a few extra questions, um, if that would have helped us to get rid of smoking, we, we, would, we would have used it. But, but I don't think that reactivity is strong enough. And the advantages of informing policy by triangulating all these methods with actual real world samples informed by four waves of longitudinal data, it, to me is astronomical and a massive opportunity to be proposed for rapidly informing FDA hot button policy issues. Uh, and, to your point, uh, David, um, the last that I, I said, uh, I, I described, where we replicated the, um, the effect of the flavor ban on, on, uh, on illegal purchases, was done uh, after um, we invited people after they completed the ITC survey to participate in an additional uh, uh, study. And that's where we got a subsample. But because it was after they did it, we have all that data that can be used to inform uh, what we observed. This is Jody. I think the timeliness of that would be good because one of the disadvantages, I think, with this rapidly changing uh, regulatory environment is you have to be there when the, you know, when things are happening, not only to witness the change maybe, but also to provide data before the change comes. So doing something uh, on a more timely basis would be very helpful right now. And just, yeah, I think, I think the, if, we, if we think about PAD that is now in wave five, but we, it hasn't really got to the point where, where for instance, it's, it's uh, uh, showed up. I mean, it's getting there, but it's still behind. So that that really affects the the, the usefulness. Let's say for for us modelers, um, where of course we every every new wave of pad, we might update our models and try to do new estimates. But they're they're behind, right? That's that's where all these approaches are quite helpful in the sense that they can provide timely uh, and and rapid information as, as other sources uh, produce it. And I, I really like the, the suggestion of David Abrams of thinking of PAD as a source of participants where you then can combine and select, um, <clears throat> uh, for some of these, these studies. I, I imagine, like, like you said, there's complications. It'd be great to, for Andy Highland to be here or, or for anyone from, from the FDA to comment. But, uh, I think that's 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 a very important point, and I think just reiterating that this is about doing or using some of these approaches. At least that's maybe our perspective from from the modeling, using some of these approaches to obtain more timely information in a more rapid way, so our models can be really, uh, I guess, at at, at at the right uh, or capturing the right trends and the, the right patterns when we make predictions. Um, so one one question that I have, and, and I think it was it was uh, echoed by others, is about um, the challenges uh, for uh, of I guess that you face uh, doing this type of, of studies that are not traditional and and maybe might find resistance from those who are not familiar or who might be skeptical uh, about this. And I think that that was one of the related to my comments question, if you can use one to validate the results of the other, or there was a question about how can you know that the predictions or, or the conclusions from <clears throat> any of these type of studies is, 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 is reasonable, or, or you can take it to the bank uh, so that then if you put it in a simulation model, your projections or predictions will be uh, reliable. So, so any comments on that? What, is there anything that needs to be done to educate the, 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 not the public, but the research community. I think the regulators are, are understand and, and they use it, right? FDA has been using expert solicitations, for instance. Um, they're funding some of these studies, I guess all of you. Uh, so, so any anyway, any thoughts about that? How can we increase the reliability of the things that we're finding with this type of studies and also the, the confidence in this? Uh, in general, and of course, as, as they might be become inputs for modeling. So any, any thoughts or comments? So certainly um, the experimental marketplace is relatively new. Um, and of course, anything new is, is um, questioned. Um, I think to the extent that, that we can show concordance across different uh, measures would give strength to each of the measures. To the extent that um, 
any estimates that come from these uh, marketplace studies could be integrated into work that uh, Ray and David and, and Raphael, you all do to uh, model um, and show that they have predictive value, then, then it adds once again, some correlative strength. Um, but there are definitely some people who um, question the experimental marketplace. We've, we've gotten some people who are, are, uh, are saying, you know, it's an experiment. We don't want an experiment. We want to measure, we want epidemiology only. But, but, you know, there's, there are good stories to tell here. I mean, if we're scientists talking to scientists, we're going to expect that, that sort of criticism. Um, but, but there's a gap between, you know, this really good stuff, this exciting stuff, and, and kind of, you know, the public at large. Um, and, you know, I don't know how to, how to bridge that gap, but it seems to me it wouldn't take much to be able to, you know, translate the findings from DCE or experimental marketplace into, you know, into a story that, that, that you know, a good science writer would be able to run with. Um, you know, it's, it seems to me to be far closer to, you know, interesting phenomenon than a lot of epidemiology, which is, you know, and, and besides which, you know, people are, I think, overdosed with uh, COVID epidemiology anyway, so. I think you can also point out to these mechanisms some of the importance, like, which come up again and again, but like substitutability. If you pass a law, you think it's great, you're going to ban menthol and cigarettes, or ban menthol and e-cigarettes, which is what states are doing, not realizing that you're sending people back to cigarettes sometimes, so that you can't look at one without understanding the whole ecosystem. And I think that's important. And also on the idea of getting a more, like everything should converge. I think if it actually does, that's great. But I think false precision is not as valuable as actually understanding the uncertainty. So another lesson I like to tell people is there is a certain amount of uncertainty and also things change. Like if you look at the e-cigarettes, Juul went off the market, puffs came in, they went out, you know, it's just like, meanwhile, states are passing laws. so. Uh, a sense of the dynamicism that, that is dynamic and is better than a, a sense of false precision. Uh, Jody, um, now that you mentioned uncertainty, I noticed there's about uh, uh, five or six comments um, that have been uh, entered. Um, and before, but, and there's a specifically a question for you, but I want to point out one of the comments made by Rachel Mandel, and she said that grants aren't subject to the Paperwork Reduction Act. It applies to the federal government and its contracts. Grants are a separate mechanism. But getting back to you, Jody, um, Esther uh, Salazar asked, could you co please comment more on how to measure uncertainty associated with parameters estimating using experimental methods and how to incorporate those into population models. Okay, so maybe I don't have the world's greatest answer on this, but let me say a couple of things. One thing I, I forgot to mention before is that one of my co-authors, John Buckle, and a co-author, Hess, they calibrate the um, DCE to real world data so that you can say, uh, frankly, I don't know the details of this, but there are ways to calibrate it uh, to the real world data so you can reduce that kind of uncertainty. But the other kind of uncertainty we have is statistical uncertainty because we have, you know, 2,000 people in our sample, and uh, we know the confidence interval. I, that's not that's a very straightforward question. But another thing that's not uncertainty, but because we can look at heterogeneity, uh, we can make actually more, more. It's not reducing the confidence interval, but more precise estimates like young women in, as you said, like a region behave differently than men, older men here. So we know that, for example, um, older smokers, they're really, they want to have their cigarettes. They don't want to go to a flavored e-cigarette. And youth don't. You know, so we can look at how these things vary. If you looked at the whole pool, it might be very uncertain. But when you get to smaller subgroups, you know with more certainty, and I'm not using that word statistically, but you know, Precision is not the right word either, but you know that these groups are heterogeneous, heterogeneous and pooling them uh, can be a mistake or not at least understanding the differences. 
I don't know if that's it. <laughs> that, I, there is, so, so Kathy Backinger raised her hand, so maybe we can let her ask the question. I'm, I'm realizing we're getting close to 245, so. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back a little bit. And thank you to Rachel Mandel for uh, clarifying about the um, need for, for OMB clearance. I just wanted to mention, because I know Ray brought this up about, and I wrote this down, why doesn't FDA fund labs to be able to do some of this more in real time? And then Dave Abrams mentioned about PATH, and I can't comment on PATH as, as I'm not into the weeds in PATH as much as I would like, but I, I just wanted to clarify something because I think you all know this, but I did want to say that, as you know, the federal government is not that nimble on being able to do any research really quickly. And so when you just think, and you all know, when you submit a grant to NIH, it takes at least 10 months. So one of our goals in TCORS was to have this or this possibility for rapid response research. And of course, that's probably in my estimation, not working as um, ideally as it could be, but you know, we are trying to get some of this, you know, as things happen because we can't announce things publicly until, I mean, I can't talk about things and we can't talk about things until it's been announced publicly. So we have to try to be as nimble as possible. And I think we're doing pretty well. And, you know, the Michigan and Georgetown T cores is exactly that, trying to do modeling, trying to look at some of our policies as we announce them to uh, better approximate the impact of some of these policies and evaluating or looking at policies at the state and community level. So I just wanted to raise that, but totally acknowledge that we don't um, we're not as nimble as, I mean, we'd like to be. And then just a reminder that, you know, when Mitch talked yesterday, he, I think one of the slides said, publish, publish, publish. You know, we need to have the peer-reviewed scientific literature to help inform our direction. And of course, the, the announcement in April of the menthol ban in cigarettes and the menthol and all flavored cigars, it's going to take a while. As he mentioned, you got to go propose rulemaking. And so thinking of, of the research now, because it's gonna take some time, will be very helpful, informative to FDA. So I just wanted to put that plug in, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And I think those are great points. And I think I think we we're, we're hope that a lot of the work that we're doing, Castor, for instance, regarding the mental band that started as a rapid response proposal, uh, it's, 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 it's starting to come out and it's, it's great. It would have been better if it would have come out faster. Uh, we've been uh, affected and delayed by, by some of the things that delay, for instance, that, that publication, which is the ultimate goal uh, that we'll be, for instance, discussing tomorrow on, on, how, on, the, on the breakout on, on how to come up with timely and, and efficient modeling. And that also relates to all the discussions and conversations that we're having now. Um, so, so thank you. Great. Uh, I think there's time for a couple more questions. Um, uh, my comments ask uh, if the panel could comment on the value of international between between country comparisons, since the policy variation is dramatic. FDA only funds your studies, uh, which might be like it's a missed opportunity. Uh, so, any any comments? I think Warren, you, you show yeah. your results about. Our yeah. So the with the 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 ITC project, which. Um, is uh, funded uh, by NIH and also has collaborators uh, who bring their own funding from different other countries, provides a, a unique opportunity to explore that. And indeed with the, um, the NIH support of ITC that has encompassed different countries. So apparently at least at the level of NIH, there's, there's openness to uh, this cross country comparison um, David, you're part of the ITC. Um, is that consistent with your viewpoint? Oh, definitely, definitely. And I, and I, I, I feel that you know my involvement in both the ITC and Casters really has a, a very synergistic uh, kind of effect. Um, I would also point out that uh, you know uh, I forget the name of the grant, but um, 
uh, one of the cancer groups in England is has put out a call for research. UK, yeah, to, cancer research. Yeah, and and so I, I think increasingly there's going to be work uh, that uh, is from different countries and that could you know really uh, you, you know benefit uh, you, you know and, and provide insight to the kind of modeling that we do in Castor. So th thank you everyone. I think I hate, I hate to be the one again, who's going to cut the discussion. I think we could go hours. And part of it is with the goal that you keep some of your ideas, thoughts and points for tomorrow's breakouts. 